I leave for setting it off. I'd just like to thank Simon, Pat, and Eva for having me following on from a guy who speaks five languages. <laughs> <laughs> and believe he's got superpowers. <laughs> I mean, how can I fail? How can I fail? Right? <laughs> just to say what Pat, following on from Pat, this really is a great venue. Um, and <laughs> Uh, it really is a great venue. For those of you who haven't been in Ireland before, this venue, um, the significance of the historical connection is obviously obvious, but the two sports that are played out in the field are Gaelic football and hurling. And to describe hurling is like looking at a soccer match. Who understands what soccer is? It's 22 guys running around the pitch pretending that they're hurt, right? <laughs> well, try to imagine 30 guys running around the pitch pretending that they're not. <laughs> and that is hurling. It's quite a significant, and that is the Irish. So, if I was trying to quantify who I am and what I do, is I'm a serial starter-upper, right? And as any other serial starter-uppers in the room understand, that you just hope that one of the starter-uppers makes it 10 times for the other 10 that you started that made you nothing. And that's really what keeps me going. But about three, four years ago now, <laughs> th this is Dobby. And Dobby Banks has said all things and he's really frustrated. He got really frustrated about a lot of things I was looking at. And two of the things that I was frustrated about was Ireland, data, and Ireland and the globe and GDPR. So, effectively, shut up. <laughs> I do, I bring together people who don't really want to be together. Fierce competitors. Fellows who think that they have secret sauce, but really when you talk to them, they've none. Because very few companies have any secret sauce. And the more they collaborate together, the more they work together, and the more they find that non-secret sauce, the more achievements you can make. That's why I established Host in Ireland. As well as everything, and I know Andrew's here from Microsoft, you'd think, wouldn't you, if you go abroad, that Ireland is only a place if you're Microsoft, Google, Amazon. And yet there's thousands of opportunities that we're missing. Why? Because the perception is you have to be big. You have to have a very big legal structure or tax structure to invest here. So I set up Host in Ireland among the community of the smaller pieces of data. Because my honest belief is, is that where data rests is actually where the opportunities will be created. Because a lot of companies now are data only, and then they follow with the people. So I set up Host in Ireland with Equinix and Interaction and all these companies you don't know about, but are the backbone of the internet. I also then looked at GDPR. GDPR is something that I know nothing about, and I'm quite happy to say I don't know nothing about it, because I'm the ideal person to stand up in front of a room wanting to know about GDPR, can I? But really, two years ago, there was groups of people who were throwing lawyers at GDPR, and there was groups of people who really needed to know about it. But I've been through all this before. Many of you also have been through statutory obligations to do something. And really, the guys that really know about it, there's no real benefit for them, for everybody to know about it too early. Think about it, six months before. Ah, oh, I need to get this done. Yeah, well, I'm going to throw 20 guys at it for $40,000 a week, and that's... So why did I set up GDPR Awareness Coalition? Bringing everybody together who knew the knowledge and connected with people who didn't know the knowledge. And do it simply. Uh, I was interested in your talk earlier. You were talking about the brainiest student in the room or something, about the lack of questions. That's what jargon is, right? Legal, fiscal, that's technical. Jargon is that mode around us that stops you from asking a question, even though 90% of the room don't actually know what I'm talking about, including myself. Yeah? <laughs> so, what we did is we set up 122 easy to understand, nice pastel tone infographics, and then it just went. We have 10 million impressions on LinkedIn, we've got uh, 132. Um, Ambassadors all around the world. I think we've got 34 different languages translated of the 100 infographics, and it's just simple to understand to allow people to get the start. So they didn't really want to work together, but they saw the benefit of it. We went down to Monaco with Host in Ireland and we won the award. If you want to define craziness, Ruby Wax. <laughs> Honest to God, she's absolutely nuts, but she's good fun. And thank you, Simon, again. You gave us this award a couple of weeks ago in the, the, the basement of the Eli, which was great, wonderful, and thank you so much for the award. But really, it's not about me. It's about the, uh, the, the ambassadors and the, and the volunteer ambassadors. So, who remembers Bill Gates said that there'd be a paperless office by 1990? Yeah. 
Yeah. Look what this is Hager giving the other two or three. But, but it's a long way away. It's the same with autonomous cars. It's the same with everything. These things are set out there. It's like Uber. It's like the technologies that we see with uh, SpaceX and stuff. It doesn't mean we're all going to be flying with these things. It just gives us ideas to say, wow, and it takes a kid that's four years old in Boris and Austria, and he says, I want to be the next Elon Musk. Job done. Yeah? And talking about kids, the reality is, and this is really brought home by the speaker of the system to a couple of weeks ago in the United States, there isn't a child in the United States right now born under the age of three that won't remember talking to his house or her house. Yeah? Now the problem with that is, and, and we've got Cortana in the room obviously with Microsoft, but with Alexa, if I got an Alexa at Christmas, you don't have to say please or thank you. You just say, Alexa, do this, Alexa, do that, and then my four-year-old or eight-year-old turns around and says, Dad, go get more money and bring me home more food. <laughs> it's going to change. These are the dynamics that are going to happen, right? But you don't have to talk, you don't have to be nice to your car. It just starts every time. And that's what these Alexa is going to do. And what it actually does is really interesting. Anybody have an idea? You knew Star Trek, so you must know who this dude is. No, I actually don't. Well, I didn't either, so no. don't worry about it. He is Maslow. Anyone know Maslow? Yeah. Well, yeah, we all probably somewhere forgot about him. He was the guy who looked at the world that was created 4.7 billion years ago and decided that we saw that of a pond, 4.7 million, and looked at what our prime needs were. And these are our prime needs. We need to be warmed, loved, fed, and all that other stuff that we just don't want to even listen to and understand. But what he forgot, and what he didn't know in the 50s and 60s, was these dudes, with their brands, from Microsoft to Alibaba to Amazon to whoever, <laughs> we're going to call along, because I can't remember his name. <laughs> when that happens to the Microsoft guys in the room, do you? <laughs> but he didn't know about this, and therefore he didn't know about this. So I can tell you right now, that if we're fed and we arrive here and we're warm, we put our coats on. I take the Wi-Fi out of this room and take your phones away, and 50% of you will be twitching by the end of my presentation. <laughs> and I know, I said my kids, I keep them fed, I love them to bits, I talk about them all the time, but I can't get them to come to dinner at the same time. My wife can't. Disconnect the router, the Wi-Fi router. <laughs> Where's it going now? There, get feeding. This is the life bulb. These are actually the new two norms of the ecosystem of life. That is why we're not at the dot-com bubble stage. I have people throw dot-com stuff at me all the time. Oh, we had this before, we had this before, we did this before, we tried that before. No, the last time what we gave people was a Nokia 6310. Knock yourself out and generate 5 billion text messages. You've got a piece of equipment in your pocket that's 20 times more powerful than the CPU that put man on the moon in the 60s. It's a whole different dynamic. We don't even talk anymore. Again, the kids, I asked them, did you talk to your grandmother? Did you talk to them? Yeah, absolutely. And I bet you they've used every medium from Snapchat to this, to that, to that, to talk. They did a recent Harvard test between three millennials. What is a millennial? Whatever it is. That were Mandarin. You like this because you're into translation. Mandarin, Italian, Spanish, and something else. And they told them not to speak English, don't speak anything, just an emoji. Communicate emoji. Three months later, they came back and they were able to tell them, within reason, who they were, where they were, where they lived, how many children they were part of, how many big family. They speak emoji, a language, different language. If there's anybody up there and you're looking and, and you're specifically, you're quite a young audience, which is great, you don't see any surprises there. Would you be amazed at the amount of people I show that to? They go, yeah, yeah, they're the disruptive companies. They're so last year. Most of these guys have already been disrupted. Most of these companies have already been plagiarized, broken up, changed, but they're the forefront of as a service. The as a service mentality. When I want it, I want to get it. I want to own things, maybe, but more than likely I want to rent it. So these are the types of technologies that are coming down the stream to the connected planet. Again, the video from the World Economic Forum gave me a sort of an insight into what the devices would look like. But in terms of numbers, and it does feed very much into the whole discussion about GDPR data privacy. What have we got now? About 10 billion things connected to the internet? 50 billion within another two years? 
At 10 billion payments, we can keep it secure. We have no chance with 50 and 350 billion by the end of 2030. That's why GDPR is important. Nothing to do with data privacy and data protection. It's about actually bringing back control of that data. Because if we lose control, we're boost. That's a technical term. <laughs> and there's not a single ecosystem that is immune to being taken over by software, by apps. I gave a talk in the Dublin uh, Convention Centre the day that the, the uh, what is it called, the Agricultural Show, what's that called, the big Agricultural Show in September? Well, the Flowering yeah. Championship, right? And I was thinking, I bet you that's an industry that hasn't been disrupted by apps. And I'm listening to news talk on the way in, and they go into a tent and they're talking about, and now we're going to announce the winner of the app for the Agriculture of the Year show, blah, blah, blah. Tinder for bulls. <laughs> Don't think about it too much. <laughs> Don't think about it too much. But apparently there's a problem with bulls if you have too much of the same blood and all. But don't think about it too much because it can bring you places that you don't want <laughs> So, have a look at the amount of data that is just being generated every second of every day and has been duplicated and triplicated and backed up and then used and AI and then more data is coming out of the data that was created. And have a look at this number here in particular. So for 42 seconds, I'd be talking rubbish, and 900 and whatever that is, right? 1 million something gigabytes of data. Because we can't comprehend that amount of data. And this is the curve that you must somehow be mindful and cognizant of. Is that, how many people have heard people are given decks by corporates? Oh, the amount of data that was created in the last year is 95% of the data that was ever created. That was just so last year. Why? Because we're now at the stage where data created every quarter is equal to all of the data that was ever created and stored before the year 2010. Every quarter, every three months. And by the end of 2025, we'll be at the stage where it'll be down to weeks. And soon it will be down to hours. Because 30, 40, 50 billion devices and remember, up to now, most of the data is created by us. And our little fingers and our little brain are only so fast for our little clickers. When you've got machines and cars and autonomous traffic light systems talking to uh, cars and all the rest, they can create data that you've never, ever seen in terms of the, the volumes. But we can't comprehend that. You're a localization people. What, what's a bit of jargon to us? Give me a bit of jargon in this industry. Come on. You're not an expert. Give me a bit of jargon in the survey and be business. Five languages. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, give me a bit of jargon and do you or localization? Huh? <laughs> localization ability. Localization ability. Look, is that a word? Localizability. Localizability. Okay, localizability. Okay. Well to me who hasn't got a clue about your industry, that just sounds like complete nonsense, made up words, right? It's the same with data. Stand up with Paul Peter, so it's gonna be a seat by the data and it's gonna be intro. No. Nobody really knows, particularly the people you're trying to influence. I was speaking to, to somebody outside, and talking jargon is great. It makes you feel well, makes you feel good, and it also builds that moat around you, as I said earlier. This would give you a sense of how much data there is. If you break it down into a grain of rice, how many people know what a grain of rice is? Everybody. Fantastic. One gigabyte. You saw that it was a million, was it 10 million or 1 million? One million? Gigabytes of data were created in that 42 seconds. That's 3 million 40 foot containers full of rice. That's created, that needs to be stored, that needs to be duplicated, needs to be uh, secure, and that's the data that we're creating. And now we're into the zettabyte world. A zettabyte of data, how many people have heard thought leaders and people, it was zettabyte era. Do you know how much a zettabyte of data is? Pat, educated man like it. No clue. No clue. But it will fill the Pacific Ocean with rice. One zettabyte. Lost the plane there recently? <laughs> Big ocean. And we're at the era now with that, there'll be 22 of them that we're all going to have to keep safe. I'm building up to a crescendo here, you're trying to get a sense of why data privacy and data security and GDPR and all that good stuff. It's actually important. Because that, oh, 22 Z bytes of data is an awful lot, and that's only by 2020. And we have to keep it secure. I think I've got this slide coming up, I hope I have, but more important is the new slide that I have now from IDC, which is 4% of all data, of all of that stuff, is going to be uber critical, life-changing critical by 2025. 
hard defibrillators and things and traffic light systems and all <coughs> kinds of systems. 4% can change your life or change somebody else's life. That's why it's important. Never a man for too many words, but he's probably right. How many people have these drawn out plans? Your CEO, we're going to have a call every three months or three weeks or two weeks and then people lose interest. You've got to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, then basically you just like the rest of the sluggers. And that's what data is all about. I've changed this. I'll come back to my favourite, which is Jack Nicholson later. But I think most people of this generation, of your generation, know who this dude is. Yeah. <laughs> Leo. Leo. You know him like you're out of the top of But Leo DiCaprio is the analogy of data. Just think of data in your own organizations. You bring home this great idea of data and everybody's really excited about it. The CEO, CMO, CFO, CEO. Yeah, and then you say data privacy, data protection, data compliance and hosting, and they turn into a totally different animal. <laughs> the CEO, he said, Do I have to know this stuff? And the security dude has already gone to the dark side long before GDPR and data privacy. But the reality is everybody loves this idea of data. Nonsense being spoken by nonsense people that data is the new oil. How many people think that data is the new oil? Keep your hands down. <laughs> data has always been the oxygen of the planet. From the time that dudes were on the top of the hills with smoke signals, that's called data. Whoever knew what the data and the smoke signals meant had an advantage. So having timely and accurate data has always been the oxygen of the planet. And this idea of oil, if you ever see it, bat it down every opportunity, because that's implying that you either have it or I don't. And we all know that the kid in Lisbon, as you saw, has the same opportunity now to create an application as the same dude in Zimbabwe, as the same dude. This whole idea of you have it, we're rich, just through fluke of oil or gas, we need to stop that discussion. This is a whole new fabric where the innovators and the creators will just be able to, because you don't have to have millions. But that's, that's what happens. And this is the slide I alluded to. This is the, the old data, this is the new data. Life critical. All this stuff is meant to be and going to be connected up. Ultimately, that's why you need to keep stuff secure. That's why. We call it GDPR in Europe, but it makes an awful lot of sense, doesn't it? That's me, my family. 1979, I lived in rat mines, and we used to go to Bray every single Sunday in a Morris Miner. Has anybody any idea how big a Morris Miner is? <laughs> Half the size of a mini. My sister Louise used to be in the boot. Then, 1979 came. Anybody know what happened in 79? For cars? You had to have a safety belt. Retrospectively, you had to have a safety belt. Can you imagine what it was like to put a safety belt retrospectively into a car like a Morris Miner? It was a disaster. Now visualize GDPR. Your biggest challenge is actually not the stuff going forward. It's all retrospective data that you have to basically know. Did I, where did I get it from? How did I get it? How do I store it? How do I secure it? That's the safety belt moment. Retrospectively, it's a nightmare. Now visualize the car that you drove in here with. Did it have airbags? Mm -hmm. Did it have safety belts? Mm -hmm. Did it have noises coming left, right, center, and all over when you went near the next side? Yeah. Did it have a camera when you were reversing? Yeah. Now we look back and we say, you mean you used to drive around without a safety belt? GDPR in 20 years. Our kids next generation go, you went on the internet without having all this stuff? <laughs> That's how you sell it. That's how you sell it to the people that are saying, oh, just keep it safe. No, we're driving around without any safety belt. Easy as. It's not that hard to break into systems. It's actually way, way easier than you might think. You know? Why? Because you're leaving trails all over the place. And if you're clever, and I know a lot of you people have forgotten more about data and how to use it than I'd ever know, use it as an advantage. 1979 ad from Audi. I still think Audi make the safest cars. Why? Because they said safety belts are an inevitability. We're going to put side impact bars and we'll sell it as a feature. Spring proud bomb technique. Remember that? You translate that for me. But I still think that they're the safest cars in the world. Audi, for some strange reason, 
So the cyberpunk designer are saying, well, GDPR is an inevitability. Why don't we pump out the prices around it? But these two did say. Helen Dixon, do you know this lady? Helen Dixon? Helen Dixon is the Irish Commissioner for Data Protection, probably the most important person in the planet or known around data privacy and data protection. Because Ireland is going to become the then number one location for DPLs. Why? Oh, well, it's soft touch and oh, yeah, tax and all that. No, we speak English. Easy as. And I know I'm talking to people who make a lot of money from actually translating, but I've talked to a client recently, and he said to me, Do you know, buddy, the big thing about Ireland is everyone speaks English until there's a problem in other places. Think about it. I was in America recently, right? I had a wonderful holiday in, in Fort Lauderdale. Lady coming in, lady going out, cleaning the room, doing all that type of man coming in, cleaning the room, and took my listen in our room, and nobody spoke English. Up to that point, everybody spoke English. <laughs> that is, when you're talking about criticality like this, the interpretations of the GDPR, the interpretations of legal framework, and then we get to the legal framework, Ireland is the only one left after Brexit with common law. Lots of money to be made by the US lawyers. They also work in common law. Rest of Europe, civil, right? Different framework. So don't believe all the stuff, break it down, follow the money and understand the real reasons. And that's why Helen Dixon now is going to be the number one. If you've ever listened to her speaking, she is just the brightest thing that I think I've ever listened to. She worked for Citrix for five years. So now when I'm listening to her, I, I see a person who understands the disease and also now understands what the patient needs. A lot of legislators and commissioners are actually theorists. They're like, as I said earlier, they've got their driving test, the theory part done. They've never actually driven a car. Can you use that again? <laughs> right? That used to be data privacy, data security in a company. You bring it up, you was like you got black debt. Don't bring that up. Now it's all going to have to change. Why? Because of reputational loss and the possibilities of fines. And uh, loads of these types of things. <laughs> Doesn't look like me, but 
That's how I feel about those types of things. But I use it by way of illustration. So, the connected planet is happening. There isn't a device that is either here, on your car, on your, that isn't going to generate data. We've got to keep it safe. It's got to be secure. And it's got to be in a framework. In Europe, it looks like it's going to be GDPR. Um, but they're just security by design, privacy by design, they're just frameworks. It's going to happen. Okay, this is cheap. The rice is going to be so much different. It's not all going to be one type of rice, and one ocean of rice. It's going to be all the rices that you guys serve or monkey, serve a monkey. Everything is going to have to be blended together, and that's what the challenge is. I'm sure Andrew will highlight this later on. Is that with hybrid cloud, where you've got a bit here and a bit there and a bit everywhere, it's easy to keep AWS or Azure secure. But well, imagine if you have your own bit here, some more here, some more there, and then on a different continent, you've got to bring it all together and serve it up to somebody as final omelet. Where it was. <laughs> ah, there's me, man. And watch more Jack Nicholson movies. It's very calming and it's way more uh, uh, appealing than uh, your mate, Leo. Thank you.